Okay. So it's, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Sergio Carparara from the physics department of Rome, La Sapienza. And he will speak about, you see in the title, percolative metal to superconductor transmission in systems with disorder at the nanoscale. He will um, start with a very introductive uh, uh, talk. And then for people who are interested and then uh, and want to know something more, he, he's, uh, he can go further at the end of the seminar, okay. Thank you, thank you Nicoletta and thank you everybody. So uh, this is a talk that is about uh, a research that we have been carrying out for the last say 10 years. So there is plenty of results and possible applications. Some of them are more interesting to physicists, other are more of a general character. So I will make a very uh, pedagogical introduction to the matter, and then maybe go through some of the results that we have, we have obtained along the years, and then go to some of the conclusions I can doesn't work anymore. Uh, Sergio, try to stop the sharing and start again. I think after some time, maybe. Okay, I'll try it back. Let's see. No, it doesn't react. So this is an outline of my talk. There is an introitus where I will discuss about electric currents in inhomogeneous media. Then I will discuss some experimental facts with, which are the motivation of this research. And in particular, I will discuss about superconductivity and nanoscale inhomogeneity. I will discuss results obtained within the effective medium theory and compare this result to it with these results with some exact results obtained by numerical solution of the equations and then discuss inhomogeneous multi-carrier and multi-band superconductivity, quantum criticality in this system, and then variation on the theme and the finale. So let's start with general laws for electric currents. When we are talking about uh, electric currents in uh, an inhomogeneous medium, we have to understand the scale over which we are writing our equations. We are writing the equation of macroscopic electrodynamics of continuous media. So the equations are averaged over short length and time scales. This is the average electric field, which is a macroscopic concept. And this is conservative, so the electric field is related to an electrostatic potential by the usual relation. Then you have Ohm's law, and this is a linear relation between the electric field and the current density in the medium. And the coefficient I am talking, I'm discussing about homogeneous uh, isotropic media. In principle, my applications are application in crystals, which are not isotropic. But if you discuss about phases with cubic symmetry, then the conductivity tensor is proportional to the identity tensor. And so you can encompass all the properties into a scalar, which is the conductivity of the system. So this is my object, the conductivity. And then if you have charge conservation in a stationary condition, then the divergence of your current density field is zero. And these are the three equations that we introduced to discuss the properties of our medium. Then if you take the divergence of the second equation, Ohm's law, the divergence of J is zero. So if you replace the electric field with its expression in terms of the potential, you end up with this equation. And if you develop the 
left hand side of the equation, you have two terms, one term, which is the term that only depends on the electrostatic potential and the other terms that depends on the conductance. If the conductance is constant, if the conductivity is constant across the system, then the second term is zero. And you have that your electrostatic potential is a harmonic function in your system. If not, then this is the equation you have to solve mathematically to determine given a landscape for your conductance, for your conductivity, the electrostatic potential that solves this equation with some boundary conditions. Now, as a warm up, we can start with a very simple problem. Imagine that you have a spherical domain of radius r sitting at the origin of the coordinates. And this uh, spherical domain is embedded in an infinite medium. And the system is in an external electric field, which is uniform, far away from my spherical domain. Imagine that the conductivity of the spherical domain is sigma tilde, and elsewhere the conductivity is sigma. So I have a spherical domain of conductivity sigma tilde embedded in an infinite medium of conductivity sigma. This now is a very simple uh, problem with respect to the general problem. Why? Because the conductivity is piecewise constant. So you have to solve the harmonic equation for the electrostatic potential plus some boundary conditions. So the harmonic, the electrostatic potential is harmonic everywhere because the conductivity is constant inside the sphere and outside the sphere. And then you must enforce that the potential is continuous at the surface of the sphere and that the normal component of the current density is continuous at the boundary because of charge conservation. Given these two boundary conditions, you can uh, now for students, especially this problem as a very nice dielectric analog. If you change your conductivity with the dielectric uh, constant and uh, the current density with the dielectric displacement, then you have a, a dielectric analog of this very problem. And also the solution is pretty much inspired to the, the dielectric analog. So you have to find uh, a function that depends on a vector. This vector is the external electric field E that is harmonic everywhere. So outside of the sphere, this potential is the sum of a linear potential, which gives the constant electric field plus a contribution that comes from the sphere itself that deforms the electric field around it. And this contribution from the sphere is in the form of a dipole potential, which is an harmonic, a harmonic function everywhere and depends on a vector. This vector is the external electric field. And A is a constant that must be adjusted to fit the boundary conditions. The potential inside the sphere cannot contain the second term. Why? Because the second term diverges at the origin and that cannot be. So the only harmonic function inside the sphere is this linear function. Then you impose continuity of the potential at the boundary and you have a condition that links B to A. These two constants must be related by this condition. Then you impose continuity of the normal component of the current density at the boundary and you get an explicit expression for A in terms of the conductivity of the sphere, spherical domain and the conductivity of the medium. And once you plug this expression here, you have an expression for the B constant as well. Now, as a remark, you must notice that the electric field is uniform inside the sphere, which is very nice, a very nice result. You have a uniform electric field far away. The sphere itself deforms the electric field in the medium. In the medium, the electric field is not uniform because you have this dipole-like term. Nonetheless, inside the sphere, you have a constant, a uniform and constant electric field that is parallel to the external electric field and only different, differs from the electric field by a constant B, which is fully determined in terms 
of the conductivity of the medium and of the conductivity of the sphere. So it's a very nice and very simple result. Now, imagine that you are now in a random medium. So you can imagine that you have several spheres, several spherical domains, and you concentrate on one, then one that you take sitting at the origin of your coordinates. And then you ask yourself, can I solve this problem by reducing the various complications of this problem to a situation where I have a single spherical domain, but this spherical domain is located in an effective medium. So instead of solving the problem of this medium with several uh, spherical uh, domains with different conductivities, I solve a problem with a single spherical domain in a medium with an effective conductivity that I will call sigma effective. Now, we know that the solution to this second problem exists. We have found it. And so this is the solution to the second problem. What would be the A coefficient in uh, the case of a single spherical domain in an effective medium? And then I choose the effective medium in such a way that the average over the distribution of the various conductivities of the spherical domains, the average of the coefficient of the dipolar part of the potential is zero. So I take an electric field that is uniform on average in the medium. This condition translates into this equation, which is an equation for the effective medium conductivity. I know all the conductivity activities of the various spherical domains, sigma i, i runs through all the spherical domains in my system, and I take the conductivity of the medium to be sigma effective medium, which is a solution to this equation. Now, this coefficient two, you can easily realize it going back to the equation, is two because we are working in three dimension with a sphere. In a generic dimension, because we are solving the uh, Poisson equation in D dimension, the Laplace equation in D dimension, then this would be D minus one, the dimensionality of the sphere minus one. So in three dimension, this is a two, in two dimension, this is a one, and in one dimension where a sphere becomes a segment, this is zero, and the result then is very trivial. In zero dimension, then you have the series of all the resistance. The resistance of the medium is nothing but the series of all, uh, the conductance of the medium is nothing but the, the series of all the conductances, which in one dimension is an exact result, of course. Now, after this introduction, I will go through some experimental facts that motivated this research to start with. So uh, let's say, like 15 years ago, some experiments were carried out on oxide interfaces. These oxide interfaces are very curious because you take two oxides. One is strontium titanate, and the other is lanthanum titanate or lanthanum aluminate. Both of these are insulators. You make a sandwich of the two, and then you find out that the, the interface between the two insulators, you can form a two-dimensional electron gas. This is a very striking result because you take two insulators, you join them, and at the interface, you form a two-dimensional electron gas, which is really two-dimensional. The thickness of this two-dimensional electron gas was measured to be few nanometers. So it's really a very two-dimensional electron gas. So this is more or less the situation. You have lanthanum aluminate or lanthanum titanate on top. Then you have the two dimensional electron gas, and then you have bulk strontium titanate. And what is even more interesting is that you can gate the two dimensional electron gas by standard gating. So you have a difference of potential between this far end of the strontium titanate and the two dimensional electron gas. 
and you can vary the charge carrier density at the interface by simple gating. This is common in semiconductors. You can vary the carrier density in semiconductors by gating. What is striking of these systems is that there are several evidences of electron inhomogeneity. I will give just some piezo force microscopy experiments where you see that you have domains, just to have an idea, this is 100 nanometers. So you clearly see the formation of domains in this system. Maybe these are self-organized, we don't know. Maybe they are introduced by some defects at the interfaces. We don't really know, but what we see is that there are these domains. And what is even more interesting is that this two-dimensional electron gas can become superconducting. Yes. Uh, sorry, with the microphone. You are showing charge domain. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. Yes. This, uh, a snapshot of charge distribution. Yes. So we believe that, the, that, that there is a, a tiny but effective uh, charge carriers modulation across the system. This is one description. So what is interesting here is the occurrence of superconductivity. So this was the first example of superconductivity that can be induced by gating, which is striking by itself. And this is a typical situation. Here you have a large positive gating, and this is the resistance as a function of temperature. You start from a metallic state here, you lower the temperature, and your resistance goes to zero with a very, very long tail. This is a very wide transition, which cannot be possibly described by standard fluctuational mechanism, like, for instance, paraconductivity. This is a very large, very broad superconducting transition. Now you reduce the charge density, you reduce the gating. So when you go up with these curves, you are reducing the carrier density in your system. And of course, the resistance in the metallic state increases. The system is less and less metallic until in the end it becomes insulating like. This is a weakly localizing insulator. And your superconducting uh, transition temperature decreases. You see that you go from this situation to this, to this, to this, to this, and this. What was striking, this was two years, uh, 10 years ago. What was striking of all these curves is that you see in a situation like this, you see that there is a superconducting transition nonetheless. You go from a metal to a superconductor. But look at this curve here. You have a metal, you have a huge fraction of your sample, which must be superconducting because your resistance drops quite abruptly. But then at low temperature, you reach a state with a finite resistance. This is not a superconductor. The resistance of your two-dimensional electron gas is finite down to very low temperature. Nonetheless, there must be a significant fraction of your system that has become superconducting. At least this is our interpretation of these curves. So we think, and I will discuss maybe some of these results, that the superconducting state in this system, in these interfaces, and then we found out also in many other systems, but I will take these interfaces as a paradigm paradigmatic example, this superconducting state is inhomogeneous. And I will show you that the resistance, the superfluid density, the tunneling spectra are rather well described within the effective medium theory. When discussing the metal to superconductor transition is much less, but this comes at no cost, to use the resistivity instead of the conductivity. Why? because the resistivity is zero in the superconducting state, whereas the conductivity is infinite. So not to have infinites around, you may change your variable from sigma to resistivity, which is nothing but sigma minus one. So we are going to assign to a metallic island 
a resistant, which is a constant. You can think of this constant as the resistance in the metallic state. And to the superconducting island, a resistant that is zero. And then we will assign to our superconducting islands a random superconducting critical temperature that is extracted from some distribution, say Gaussian or maybe another that you like. This uh, work has been carried out along so many years, so there are quite many collaborators on the theory and on the experiments. And I will go to the first part of my results, which is superconductivity and nanoscaling homogeneity. So the whole effect measurements reveal the presence of two kinds of carriers with low and high mobility. What is interesting is that the high mobility carriers represent the majority of the carriers in your system, but they have a very low mobility. And then at a certain gating around zero, the high mobility carrier, which are a minority fraction of the carriers appear, they have a very high mobility. And it seems that at this interface, superconductivity appears together with the appearance of the high mobility carriers. Our discussion, then our description of the system is like this. We imagine that we have superconducting puddles embedded in a weakly localizing metallic background. And I will try to convince you that this will give rise to a percolative character of the superconducting to metal trans of the metal to superconductor transition, which is a possible resistance curves like this. So here we have uh, the colored curves are the experimental data and the dashed lines are our fitting with uh, the effective medium theory. As you see, the data are rather satisfactorily descri described by the theory. You start from a metal to a superconductor. And when your superconducting fraction, for some reason, goes below the percolation threshold, which for homogeneous disorder in two dimension is one half, when your superconducting fraction goes below the percolation threshold, then you don't reach a superconducting state at zero temperature. You end up in a metallic state with a much lower resistance because you have a lot of superconducting islands embedded in uh, the metallic matrix, but nonetheless, in the end, you have not a superconducting percolating path from one end of your system to the other, and then the final total resistance is finite. So this is a second tutorial part of this talk. Imagine that you are given a distribution of critical temperature. This is maybe a Gaussian. So imagine that for some reasons you have region with rather large critical temperature and region with rather low critical temperature. And maybe also a fraction that will never become superconducting. No matter what you do, there is a fraction maybe where locally disorder is so strong, and this is microscopic disorder, is so strong that you will never turn this component superconducting. So I assign a total weight W to the superconducting component and the total weight one minus W to the metallic component. And then I start from very high temperature. My temperature says here, here, this temperature is larger than all the critical temperature or no, of all the superconductors. And then you have a, a metallic state. Your resistivity is the resistivity of a metallic state. Then you start lowering the temperature. For instance, now you are here, here, there are some islands whose superconducting critical temperature is larger than this temperature. And so we, you will start to nucleate some superconducting islands inside your system. And then because of these islands inside your system, then your resistance will be smaller than the resistance in the metallic state. Because locally, you have zero resistance islands that reduce the overall resistance of the sample you lower even more the temperature. Now you are here. 
So all these regions with a superconducting critical temperature larger than this value are turn, have turned superconducting. So you have more superconducting region and you are here in the resistance curve. Then you go even down more lower in temperature and you have other regions that are nucleating and you are down here. Now imagine that when you reach zero temperature, you have nucleated all the regions that could possibly nucleate. If this fraction is less than one half for some reason, one half if you have homogeneously distributed disorder. If you have a sp spatially correlated disorder, then of course the percolating fraction can be even much less than one half. But let's assume just for the sake of discussion that we have a completely randomly disordered medium, then the percolation threshold is one half. If your total superconducting fraction is less than one half, as you see, there is no percolating superconducting path from one end of your system to the other hand, end. And so the final resistance is finite. Of course, this is much lower than the resistance in the metallic state. Why? Because you have a lot of superconducting islands inside your sample. So this description is satisfactory. And from the point of view of the data, don't forget that you measure a resistance curve. So this curve is measured. If you assume that your distribution is a Gaussian, then, or say symmetric, then the inflection point of this resistance curve is a direct measurement of the average critical temperature in your sample. And the width of the transition is a direct measure of the width of the distribution of critical temperatures in your samples. So you can extract directly from the experiments some information about the distribution of your critical temperature. Maybe you don't know the distribution because well, the data are so noisy that it's very difficult to tell from the data whether this distribution is a Gaussian or maybe a Lorentzian. I will come back to this point later on where anyway, you can say something. And, but you can extract nonetheless some significant parameters. For instance, if you have a Gaussian distribution of critical temperature, you have an exact analytical solution within the effective medium theory. This is just the solution. So the resistivity in your sample as a function of the temperature is the resistivity at high temperature, the one you measure in the metallic phase, times this function, which is nothing but the maximum between the argument and zero. And this is one minus W, which is the metallic fraction, times the resistance at high temperature plus W, the superconducting fraction, times this error function, whose width is related to the width of the distribution of critical temperatures. With this function, which is explicit and analytical solution, you can fit the data. And this is what we did here. So the broken line are the fits obtained with this solution within the effective medium theory. So as you see, the effective medium theory is quite satisfactory. It gives a reasonable description of the data. What is not really satisfactory with this solution is this fact. As you see, the transition is always very tileish. Even when the, the transition finally occurs, you see that the resistance goes to zero with a very long tail. Now, if you are, say, with a Gaussian, but even with other distribution for your critical temperature, to obtain this tail, you must exhaust all your distribution, which means that your weight of the superconducting cluster is close to the percolation threshold. As you see, the point give for the weight of a superconducting cluster exactly the percolation value one and a half. Why? Because why we are assuming that this order is homogeneous, and then we are forcing our cluster to be exactly close to the percolation threshold to produce these long tails in the resistance curves. Of course, if you abandon this assumption that this order is homogeneous in your system, then you get much more reasonable solution where your uh, uh, superconducting fraction may 
not really be at the percolation threshold, but of course you can no longer use effective medium theory to solve. You have to go to the exact solution of um, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's, Kirchhoff laws in uh, a random uh, resistor network. And this is exactly what we did. This was a second stage of our research. After having digged into the physics of the effective medium theory approximation, we realized that to provide a better discussion for the physics of our system, we should go to a random resistor network. So now imagine that you map your system in a random network where you have, say, for instance, this square lattice and all the bonds of the lattice are assigned a resistance. And this resistance is a finite value in the metallic state or zero in the superconducting state. Then you have a random resistor network. This random resistor network is a linear set of equation so you can solve this linear set of equation exactly numerically because you take a rather large system. We usually took uh, networks like 100 times 100 resistors or 200 times 200 to have a smooth uh, solution. But uh, this you can solve with some linear algebra library to solve Kirchhoff and Ohm's laws on a square grid. Now, what we found, to a surprise, to our surprise at that time, you see here the points are um, uh, the solution obtained within uh, the random resistor networks, whereas the lines are the solutions obtained with the effective medium theory. The two fall one on top of the other if the disorder is fully random. So you assign a zero resistance or a finite resistance completely at random in your system. In this case, the effective medium theory gives a very good solution. The blue curve is a Gaussian distribution. Uh, the green curve is a Cauchy distribution or a Lorentz, if you wish, distribution which is much broader with much broader tails, fatter tails, but you have a very nice solution with the effective Newton theory for the Gaussian distribution, for the Cauchy distribution. In both cases, you exactly reproduce the exact numerical solution of the random resistor network with your effective medium approximation. Now, we wanted to go beyond the effective medium, but as you see, effective medium gives a very good description of the solution if this order is really random. So our next challenge was imagine that for some reasons, which maybe you don't know, your superconducting cluster is not really random. Maybe for some reasons, this is a rather filamentary object. So we were playing with some fractal structure. You don't re really need it to be fractal because in the end you are taking a finite sample of it. So it will never be a scale invariant fractal. It will be a system where you are produced some filaments. The green filaments here are produced by the so-called uh, uh, diffusion limited aggregation. This is just uh, some machinery that you can in invent to produce some filaments. And then you decide that your superconducting cluster only exists on those filaments, okay? So now your superconducting cluster is no longer homogeneously distributed in your system, but only exist on these filaments. What do you think now will be the comparison between effective medium and the exact solution of the random resistor network? Very bad. If you compare the two, now this is effective medium. Of course, since the fractal is very sparse, you are very far for, from the percolation threshold, very far. So effective medium will fail to give you a percolation because if you were to distribute those links in a totally random way across your system, then you will, would be very far from percolation. But as you see, those filaments do percolate because they were produced by a diffusion limited aggregation. So by definition, they percolate. They go from one end of the system to the other. So 
the real numerical solution does percolate, and you see a very nice metal to superconductor transition. Now, this transition has two main characteristics of the real transition observed in experiment. These very long tails, you see here a magnification of the tails. The dots are the experimental data, and the red and yellow curves were obtained by numerical solution of the random resistor network with a fractal structure or a pseudo fractal structure of the superconducting cluster. And this produces very long tails because you have to populate your fractal before percolating. But on a fractal, you, per you can percolate with a superconducting fraction, which is much less than uh, the percolation threshold in two dimension with totally random disorder. So it seems that the data indicate that your system, for some reasons, is developing a filamentary structure of the superconducting cluster, which is, in our opinion, the simplest possible explanation for these long tails close to percolation. If you want to percolate with a very, very long tail, you have to have, you ha have, to have a very sparse uh, cluster because otherwise you percolate without such a long tail. Of course, you can claim that is the distribution that is singular. Maybe you can invent now a very singular strange distribution that gives this long tail with a rather homogeneous disorder. But in our opinion, this is a very, very um, unnatural explanation to the phenomenon. It, it is much more um, reasonable in our opinion to imagine that for some reasons you are producing this uh, uh, filamentary cluster. Now I will not go through the details, but you can extend the effective medium theory to finite frequency because you know the metal to superconducting transition is very boring when you, when, when you are in the superconducting phase because in the superconducting phase, the resistance is zero. So there is very little to tell in the superconducting state if you study transport at zero frequency because in, uh, a uh, if you're running a current through your uh, superconductor and your current is below the critical current of the superconducting state, then you experience a zero resistance and that's all. But if you now measure the response of your system at a finite frequency, then there is an, interest, an interesting response in the superconducting phase two. This response at low frequency is purely reactive. So the conductance is purely imaginary. The real part of the resistance is zero, but you have a purely imaginary conductance, which gives the reactive response of your superconducting cluster. And the coefficient of this reactive response is related to the superfluid density of your superconducting cluster. Now, it is very easy to find that, that in effective medium theory, this superconducting uh, superfluid density is the difference between the fraction of superconducting bonds and the fraction of metallic bonds as a function of temperature. So, if you have more metallic than superconducting, this quantity is negative, which means that you have no superfluid response. If this is larger than this, which means that you are above one half for your uh, superconducting fraction in a homogeneous system, then you will have a superfluid response in your system. And the superfluid response is very, very much different from the superfluid response of a homogeneous superconductor. Why? because again, the width of this superfluid response is ruled by the width of the distribution of uh, your uh, critical temperature of disorder in your system. So you have hint for a inhomogeneous superconducting state, even if you measure the finite frequency response below the superconducting critical temperature. Sorry, Sergio, there is a question uh, online. Okay, so I can stop and... Uh, uh, yes. um, so, sorry, uh, could you please uh, um, explain uh, the, the concept of superfluid response? Yes, 
So I will. Uh, uh, can I can I use the 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 blackboard, Serena? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but I okay. Now yeah. I see it. So I I will make a very very stupid model, which is the Drude model. But this, in my opinion, gives a very nice example of what goes on if you are discussing the superfluid response. In the Drude model, the conductivity is sigma naught, the constant. I will write this constant in a while, times 1 plus i omega tau, where tau is the scattering time and omega is the frequency. This is the conductivity at some finite frequency, real and imaginary part. What is sigma naught in the Drude model? In the Drude model, sigma naught is related to the density of carriers times their charge squared, that this is times the scattering time divided by their mass, the mass of the carriers. This is standard Drude model. Now, let me calculate the resistivity, which is the inverse. This is now. This is uh, much easier to interpret because now you can uh, read of this formula the real part and the imaginary part. The real part is just a resistance per unit length, per unit whatever, and the imaginary part is an inductance. This is an impedance whose real part you can interpret as a resistance and whose imaginary part you can interpret as an inductance. So you have the response of a complex impedance with a resistance and an inductance. More interestingly, the inductance is independent of the scattering time. So I write now my formula for the inductance. This is tau over sigma naught, and I read from this formula that tau drops, and you have m divided by n e squared. Now, but for this trivial factor e squared, this is nothing but the inverse of what is called the superfluid stiffness, the ratio between the number of superfluid carriers and their mass. Now, what happens in a metallic island? In a metallic island, this is finite, and at low frequency, this completely overshadows this term. So a metallic island will respond in a resistive way. But what in a superconducting island? In a superconducting island, the resistance is zero. And so a superconducting island has a purely reactive response. Purely reactive means purely imaginary. And this purely imaginary response is purely inductive and is related to the superfluid density of your system. So you can associate your purely reactive response in a superconductive island to the local superfluid density. And then you can ask yourself, what if now my superconductor percolates? And then the result is immediately this, that you can calculate now the reactive response of the entire random impedance network. Now you have an impedance network because you are at some finite frequency. And you can calculate the reactive response and effective medium theory will give you that when the resistance of the cluster is zero, your response is purely inductive. So you can extract directly from the effective medium solution your superfluid fraction. And the nice of effective medium theory where disorder is completely random is that this is nothing but the difference between the, super, the density of the fraction of superconducting clusters and the fraction of metallic clusters as a function of temperature, whenever this is greater than zero, which means that you need superconductivity to percolate in order to have a purely reactive response, which is, I would say, reasonable. OK? This is with effective medium theory. So of course, there are the drawbacks. You only percolate when you have more than one half superconducting uh, bonds in your system. Otherwise, you don't percolate. But of course, you can easily overcome this limitation by going to a random impedance network on some 
filamentary structure. This is just to show that with effective medium theory, you have a very reasonable description of your superfluid density. And this is something which is very different from the superfluid response of a standard homogeneous superconductor. Especially look, this curve here, you could never possibly describe this with a standard superfluid response of uh, homogeneous. This is a, a situation where your superconducting cluster is very close to percolation. So you have a very, very tiny advantage in the density of superconducting islands with respect to the metal. So they make a very, very small superfluid response. So I got stuck again, so I must interrupt. So this is an enlarged view of the superfluid response. With effective medium theory, you have a very nice description of this. Here, there is an application. I will go very fast through this, but this is yet another application. We were interested in tunneling spectra. Again, uh, the, the, the colored curves are the data and the lines are our fits with effective medium theory. What was striking about this, uh, uh, the curves are uh, displaced vertically for a better view. But I can uh, tell you that what is stri striking in all this curve is that there is a very large value of the tunneling conductance. This is the differential tunneling conductance. There is a very large value at zero bias. Usually in a, in a superconductor, the zero bias value goes to zero or very close to zero. Here, you have a very large value of the zero bias uh, tunneling conductance. And in our opinion, this is nothing but the result that even in the superconducting phase, you have a sizable fraction of your system that is still metallic. Even when superconductivity percolates, you have a fraction of your system that for some reasons stayed metallic down to t equals zero. And this is a good explanation for the zero bias uh, conductance in the system. And then uh, here are uh, the details of the calculation. Maybe these are a bunch of equation in effective medium. We have a density of state that is the density of state of a metal plus the density of state of a superconductor. And the density of state of, of a superconductor has three components. The density of states of all the superconducting island that have not yet turned superconducting plus the island that have turned semi superconducting, plus the island where locally the temperature is lower than the, uh, sorry, larger than, uh, sorry, the temperature is lower than the local uh, superconducting critical temperature, but those islands maybe are too small to develop phase coherence. So there are also regions that are not phase coherent. If you fit with these three components, then you have the fitting of the data that I have been uh, discussing here. So again, the, the, the colored curves are the data and the black curves are our fit of the data with the effective medium theory. This I can skip altogether, this part, uh, because my time is running short. So maybe if somebody's interested, I can go back to this. This is then the description of the superconducting state. And at that time, there was a discussion, maybe this is a strong coupling superconductor. This was, in our opinion, a very, very weird proposal. And we found that this is actually a weak coupling superconductor once you properly treat it as a multi-component, multi-band or maybe multi-carrier superconductor. So this is a bunch of BCS-like equation. And this is uh, the measured superconducting critical temperature and our fit with a BCS theory in the weak coupling limit. The dimensionless coupling is 0 0.1, which is reasonably weak coupling the supercon uh, superconductivity. So this was uh, maybe the result. And the idea, I will tell only the idea, is that, uh, re remember, there are low mobility carriers. They are a lot, but the system is not superconducting when you have only low mobility carriers the system becomes superconducting where you introduce some high mobility carriers. 
So imagine now that the, the interface, you form several subbands because your potential, your um, two-dimensional electron gas is confined in some uh, potential well. Then you have uh, the subbands that host the low mobility carriers. And when the chemical potential is there, you have no superconductivity. Once you reach the band that hosts the high mobility carrier, you start seeing superconductivity. And then that fits the data very well. And you have a superconductivity inside the high mobility carrier band without the necessity to claim that superconductivity is a strong coupling or something very weird. It's weak coupling, BCS superconductivity. Quantum criticality is again something that at that time we published a paper in uh, Nature Material about this behavior, which was at the time very, very intriguing. It seems that you have uh, two quantum critical regimes in the system. Now you take the interface and you drive your metal to superconductor, sorry, uh, superconductor to metal now transition by means of a magnetic field. So you start from the superconducting state, you increase the magnetic field, and you turn the superconductor back to the metallic state by means of the magnetic field. Now, this transition seems to occur at, with two steps, at least in the region where the density of carriers in your cluster is very large. And what is interesting is that you have two regions where you have two different scalings for your data. I will show the curves in a while. One scaling is with the, um, the dynamical exponent times the new exponent equal to two thirds. And the other is with three halves. And those two are clear, clearly different. And those two regimes correspond to two different magnetic fields, one which we call the B cross and the other that we call BC, one that is seen at higher temperature and the other that is seen at lower temperature. And what is even more interesting is that BC, the one that you see at lower temperature is larger than B cross, the one that you see at higher temperature. So this is a typical set of data here you see that you are in the superconducting state when the magnetic field is zero. You increase the magnetic field and you gradually turn your superconductor into this weakly localizing metal. Okay? Now, as a function of the magnetic field, okay? Now, if you look at the curves, there are two interesting regions. One region is a region around say 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 Kelvin, where you have a very, very flat curve at a certain value of your resistance, R cross. But then if you go to even lower temperature and slightly larger magnetic field, you find another flat region with a larger value of the resistance and a larger value of the magnetic field. Now, how do you detect these two intriguing behavior? This is just an enlarged view of the two. It is much simpler now to plot your isotherms as a function of the magnetic field. So the point where all the curves as a function of the magnetic field cross is the point where your resistance is independent of the temperature because all the isotherms cross at that point. So this is a very nice point and a very nice way to detect the crossing point, the point where your resistance is almost independent of the temperature because all the various isotherms cross there at this magnetic field here. Now, if you, say, uh, if you now plot the curves with fields larger than Bx or smaller than Bx with some scaling variable T, which is a reduced temperature, you have two scaling behavior, one above the critical point and one below the critical point. And you have this dynamical exponent, which is almost two thirds. Now, if you go to lower temperature, you have another such crossing point where again, your resistance is almost constant as a function of temperature. And again, you have good scaling with yet another exponent, which is 1.5. 1.5 is now three halves. So you have a crossover between 
two quantum critical regimes in your system. These are just uh, magnified views. And also, when you deplete a lot your two-dimensional electron gas, then B, C, and B cross come to coincide. This is a situation where the two coincide here. You have only one flat point and they coincide. But you can follow their evolution. So you go from a situation, I will show you a picture. Maybe this is interesting. This is B cross, the black dots, and this is BC, the red cross, the red dots. The red BC, the largest of the two when the two are different, scales exactly with the superconducting critical temperature with a conversion factor that is very convincing because you convert one Kelvin for one Tesla. This is uh, for people that deal with superconductivity. This is a very, very fair conversion factor between magnetic fields and temperatures. One Kelvin corresponds to one Tesla. This is pretty reasonable. And then you have another field that is almost constant in this region. Why? Why two critical fields in that region and why the two come to coincide. So there is a light blue region and a yellow region. In the light blue region, the two fields are different. In the yellow region, the two, field, the two fields coincide. What is our interpretation? This is just a magnified view of the previous graph. This is the interpretation. At large gating, where you are deep inside the metallic state, you have as a function of the field, the possibility to have a paddle superconductivity and then array superconductivity. Whereas when you are deep inside uh, the depleted region, you have only one superconductivity, the array superconductivity. Why is this so? Well, this is so because you have two lengths in your system. One length, one characteristic length scale is the typical size of your superconducting island. Say this is a given number, LD. And then you have another scale which depends on the temperature. This is the coherence length. Now, when you start from high temperature, your coherence length is much smaller than the size of a superconducting island. You now lower the temperature and the coherence length increases until it reaches the size of your superconducting islands. So you go from a situation where you start building superconductivity inside the islands, but the different islands are not coherent, to a situation where you start forming coherence between the different superconducting islands. And this uh, explains why you have two regimes in your system. And also, sorry, it allows you to estimate for the first time at that time, the sides of the paddles, because you can claim that whenever you have broken superconductivity inside a superconducting island, you have introduced the quantum flux inside an island, but you know the experimental value of the magnetic field that breaks superconductivity in the islands, according to our interpretation, you know the value of the quantum of a flux. And then by this ratio, you get that your paddles are in the order of hundreds of nanometers. So you have to imagine that each superconductor, this is the typical size. Maybe of course, in the real system, there is a distribution of different sizes, but this is a typical size of the paddles, which we estimate in the order of 100 nanometers. And with this, I think I am done with my time. So I go to variation on the theme and finale. Ever since we have explored so many consequences of our scenario, we have, for instance, studied magnetotransport, the whole effect in, in homogeneous system. And you can also discuss the whole effect by means of the effective medium theory. This is very nice. You can also have a description of the whole, whole effect with effective medium. Of course, we asked ourselves, why is the superconducting system inhomogeneous? And we came out with various proposals. All of them are essentially based on the idea that for some intrinsic mechanism, your electron gas is unstable against 
electronic phase separation. In your system, you tend to segregate regions with slightly larger, you don't need it to be very much, slightly large carrier density. It is enough that you start filling the high mobility carrier band to have superconductivity. In other region with slightly smaller density, you don't have enough carrier to promote superconductivity. And this may easily explain why in your system you have a coexisting metallic and superconducting regions. So we have been exploring the interplay between superconductivity and radiation. We have discussed how you can use this property of your electron gas to tailor maybe some devices. And we realized that since in this interface there is a strong uh, spin orbit coupling, you can use both superconductivity and spin orbit coupling to have topological superconductivity and maybe also some Majorana fermions at the end of one dimensional uh chains of these uh, uh that are tailored inside the two-dimensional electron gas we have a quantum all effect in this system we have studied as i told you we have been even we have gone even further in studying the finite frequency response with a random impedance network now we are even able to introduce dissipation in the superconductor to, so to go beyond this approximation in this approximation, if you are in the superconductor, you have a purely inductive response, no dissipation. We can introduce dissipation, which is a frequency dependence of the inductance with an imaginary part of the inductance that gives the dissipative, finite frequency, finite frequency, dissipative response inside the superconducting cluster. And then, just this is a finale because this result is uh, was obtained in the last few days look at this very nice picture what is this picture this picture has been obtained by monte carlo by my phd student julia venditti she's studying a very simple minded the very simple minded model imagine that you have uh, an eisenberg spin this spin can point along z positive along z negative and we map these two solution positive z magnetization negative z magnetization and two two different ground states of uh, say a charge density wave system why because in cuprates superconductors and other system charge density wave is a phase that seems to compete with superconductivity superconductivity is instead a situation where the spin is in the plane x y so you have a situation. Imagine that in your situation, in your system, because of disorder, you have domains, the blue and the green, where your charge density wave parameter, the Z component of the spin, points along Z in the positive direction. This is green. Or along Z in the negative direction. This is blue. Now imagine that for some reason, this is driven by disorder. We obtain this by disorder in the analog of the spin effective model. Now, how can you turn a spin up into a spin down across a domain wall? The only way you can do that topologically is that the spin rotates so that at a certain point, the spin is in the X, Y plane. But this is superconductivity. And we can measure the superfluid response that it is finite. So the red domains are superconducting domains. And they are very filamentary. So this is a very simple realization of the idea we have in mind. You have a topologically protected filamentary superconductivity that sneaks between two different domains of the charge density wave or the parameter. And they have to be, because you cannot possibly go from up spin to downspin without passing through the xy plane. And so this is topologically protected. This is very robust against disorder. And as a side product, you have a very, very filamentary superconductivity. This is a very, very recent result. So I cannot, unfortunately, tell you much more about this because these are results obtained a few days ago. But nonetheless, this is very promising because now I think we have an idea of what possible mechanisms can give rise to a filamentary 
superconducting cluster. And this is one such mechanism. And with this, I abused your passions. So I thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Ah, c'è Alessia. Ciao Alessia. Sergio. Tell uh, me. Why, why you say that uh, the superconductivity is uh, topologically protected? In, in this model, not in, I'm not saying that this is, this is a very peculiar this model. Is an interface. Uh, is the interface between two domain walls. Yeah. Yeah. So, but... Uh, it so be necessarily protected. No, no. The, uh, what I mean is this. So you start with take an Eisenberg model, where for some reason you prefer alignment along Z. So your ground state is either Z up or Z down, and you have a barrier between. And this is not a continuous symmetry. This is discrete. So you. I have no Goldstone modes or whatever. You are either spin up, so easing spin up or easing spin down in the absence of disorder. Now put some disorder in your system. Why? You can, in this effective model, disorder is a random field. Because of the random field, you will create some domains where you prefer charge density wave up and other domains where you prefer charge density wave down. Now, if you want to go from one domain to the other, you must, must go through a region where your uh, spin is in the XY plane. And to our surprise, if you measure the superfluid stiffness of this system, it is finite. And even larger than TC, in most, uh, than the temperature in most cases. So you have real uh, superconductivity in the system. So this is what we found. So in, in our opinion, you cannot possibly go from a green domain to a blue domain without passing through a red filament, which is the boundary. But this boundary is in some sense unavoidable because of the topology of SU2. You cannot go from North Pole to South Pole without crossing the equator. <laughs> you can try to do that, but there is no way. You want to go from the North Pole to the South Pole, one way or another, you have to cross the equator. In this sense, we say that this is topologically um, protected. It, 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 it's it's re-entrance of superconductivity due to disorder. This is very nice because it's something like Nicoletta was saying before uh, the seminar began. There are situations where disorder is favorable to superconductivity. You are in a situation where in the absence of disorder, you have only charge density waves or spin up and spin down. You put some disorder, and all of a sudden, superconductivity appears in your system as a filamentary, very weak, very fragile, but with a finite, finite superfluid response. We measure the superfluid response of our system with Monte Carlo, and we find that there the superfluid response is finite. Uh, whenever you have percolation of the red domains, you have uh, superconductivity in the ground state because now you have a percolating superconducting path in your system. So you, you have a finite, finite superfluid stiffness in your system. Other questions? Yes, one online. Um, is, uh, so in many of your results, uh, the dimension two does not uh, seem to be maybe essential. So I don't say, so uh, could you please comment uh, uh, about the uh, extensions of your results uh, in higher dimension, dimension three? Uh, what, uh, what, what, this particular result or, or, or the... Is, uh, your results are, uh, do you confirm it that uh, the results are for dimension two for this particular, have in mind this particular so, year? All of our results so far, were devoted to two dimensions. Why? Because the two-dimensional electron gas at oxide interfaces is really two-dimensional. Cuprates are not really two-dimensional, but are very anisotropic. 
So most people believe that first you describe the physics of copper oxygen planes, which are planes, and then maybe you should couple these planes, which is something we plan to do. Now we want to put one of these plane and another and see how two planes interact. For instance, will the superconducting on one domains in one plane linked to the superconducting domains in the plane below or not? Is there a tendency to make phase coherence across the planes or not? But yes, to answer your, to give a quick answer to your question, most of our results were devoted to, to, to the two dimensional case. In higher dimension, of course, things may, may be, uh, affecting medium theory you can use in whatever dimension because it's mean field approximation, but all other results, of course, will become much trickier in higher dimension. I, I agree with you. Okay, thanks. There are other questions? Uh, can you explain better what is the, which is the disorder in which physically I don't, I don't understand. In, in here yes. or in uh, the interfaces? Ah, yes, this, this model, if you can. Alors, in, this model is, uh, imagine that you have- uh, um, ah, You said uh, it's uh, Eisenberg plus a disorder. So you have, imagine that you have some Eisenberg coupling of the spin where you have a coupling J for SZ and a coupling alpha J for X and Y. In the absence of disorder, if alpha is less than one, this model favors alignment along Z, up or down. This is the generate, but you have a barrier in between. Now, if you put some disorder in the form, of, for instance, of a random magnetic field, you take a random field coupled to SZ, you can create region where locally there is an average field that is on average pointing up. So you favor the ground state where uh, this is pointing up and other regions where you favor this ground state with the, the spin aligned along Z in the negative direction. And this is just the effect of disorder. What was surprising to us is not only that in going from a positive to a negative domain, you have to have a region where your magnetization is on the plane, but that when we measure the superfluid the de density of this, this was finite. So it's really the, the system is maybe not so strong, it's rather fragile, but nonetheless is a filamentary superconductor. And this is, it was really surprising. So when you go from plus to minus, you go through a situation where this filament sneaks between, sneak between two different domains of the Z spin polarization of your icing like uh, model. This is the anisotropic Eisenberg. So you are in the icing universality class is if alpha is less than one and the XY universality class, which in two dimension is costellitz et Taules transition for alpha larger than one. But the size of the filaments depends on the disorder or not? No. Or on... the, so uh, this usually is a, a domain wall, as, as Sergio was saying. So this is just the formation of domain wall between spin up and spin down. Of course, uh, in easing, uh, you are either up or down. This is not SU2, but with SU2 spin, if you go, if you want to go from up to down, you have to rotate the spin. So you, you, you have to pass through the, the, the equator. With icing spin, of course, you, this is somehow, of course, you must be not too far from the symmetric point. So this is still a very strange model because you are saying that the two ground states are very close in energy. So it's not so difficult to tilt the balance. Of course, if I go deep inside the charger, so if I take a very small alpha, then there is no way 
that the system can develop a superfluid stiffness. Of course, you will have red domains, but no superconductivity around. So there is more. I, I agree with Sergio. It's not just that you go from up to down that makes the system superconductor. You have to have one more ingredient that these two are not very far in energy. So alpha is not much smaller than one. Otherwise, superconductivity will never come around. Okay. If there are no other questions, then we can uh, thank the speaker. I and thank you very much, all of you, for your attention. Okay. Okay, so if there is someone still interested to make some question. Uh, yeah, we can set the student free if they want to go yeah. and maybe enjoy the last so just please rays of write, the sun. Yeah, just please, the, the online people, just write me privately if you want to also join so that I 